Vermont. So we should be able to see um, Laura's screen now. And let me uh, begin to turn it over and pass the presenter role to Laura by saying we're pleased to have Laura Hill of the University of Vermont present today on a learning outcomes based general education sustainability requirement. For those who didn't see the announcement in full, uh, the University of Vermont adopted a learning outcome-based general education sustainability requirement in fall 2015. The requirement is unique because sustainability is a non-traditional general education theme and general education requirements are routinely course-based, not learning outcomes-based. The learning outcomes-based nature of the requirement allowed University of Vermont to create a flexible requirement with three options, taking a sustainability approved course, enrolling in a sustainability curricula, or engaging in an experiential endeavor whereby the learning outcomes can be met outside the classroom. Laura will present how the requirement was successfully implemented through the strategic consideration of three important institutional contexts, governance structure, academic culture, and the overall institutional environment. As Laura will explain, there were three stages, pre-operational and sustainability learning outcomes development, the formal process and adoption by uh, the university's faculty senate, and finally implementation. As she discusses the institutional framework and procedural steps taken, she will define key characteristics of success, including patience, and genuine attention to process, deliberate and transparent action, willingness to collaborate and alliance of students, faculty, administrators, and staff. Her case study can assist other institutions to develop their own strategies for adopting university-wide sustainability requirements. Laura Hill is a senior lecturer and research associate at University of Vermont. She co-chairs the university's Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee. She is trained as a plant ecologist and has conducted research in wetland ecosystems. Her research focuses on the potential of growing cold, hardy variety, varieties of rice in cold climates, such as the Northeast in the US. The project results have already informed farmers in the region how to utilize subprime agricultural land, for example, on dairy farms, to grow rice and increase farm diversity and income in a changing climate. She is the recipient of the 2014 Joseph E. Carrigan Award for Excellence in Teaching and Undergraduate Education. Her article, Integrating Sustainability Learning Outcomes into a University Curriculum, the basis for this presentation, is currently in press in the International Journal of Sustainability in Higher Education. With that, Laura, I hope you are able to uh, take control and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Ira, for the introduction and welcome everybody, good morning. So again, my name is Laura Hill. I'm presenting um, from Burlington, Vermont at the University of Vermont. And this is based off of a uh, presentation I gave at in back in October at the AISHI conference. So I would like to unfold some of the processes that we went through at the University of Vermont in an attempt to inform other institutions of how to roll out a similar sustainability requirement. Um, let me first tell you a bit about Vermont. So Vermont, for those of you who don't know, is a, a pretty small state. It's the sixth smallest state in the United States. And um, our dominant economies are related to technology, recreation, and health services, agriculture, dairy, as Ira mentioned, food crops, wine, cheese, um, also education and government services. So the University of Vermont is located in Burlington, Vermont, and we are a land-grant institution. Uh, we 
have approximately 13,000 students. About 10% of those are graduate students. The remaining are undergraduates. And we have eight undergraduate academic units, schools and colleges within the university. So before I get started with our case study, I would like to acknowledge um, all of the people who helped in the pre-operational stage and the maintenance stage and everything in between, particularly my co-chair, Dean Wong, who has since retired from the University of Vermont, and he has relocated to the West Coast. So without everybody's help on this slide and others, this wouldn't have happened. So it was a truly collaborative um, process that we went through. So first of all, um, I saw my colleague, Tom Hudspeth, he's tuned in here. So Tom was the, um, also an emeritus professor. He was, um, he was the director of the environmental program. Uh, which began in the early, um, actually in 1972. So in a convocation address, Tom says, UVM is rooted in values long associated with the state of Vermont, fairness, social justice, environmental stewardship, openness, independence, lack of pretense, and the achievement of practical results. And when I presented at AISHI in conversations with folks there, they said, well, of course you pulled this off. You're Vermont. You're the University of Vermont. So I would like to just make a note here that we really did have to address a lot of resistance, particularly from faculty, to adopting this university-wide gen ed requirement sustainability. So it wasn't an easy pass. We had a lot of work that we had to do and a, a lot of resistance that we had to overcome. So I'm sure everybody is familiar with this faculty resistance and it's a big hill to climb. So hopefully with a timeline of events, and some sort of words of wisdom and recommendations toward the end, you can adopt a similar uh, gen ed requirement or university-wide requirement in sustainability at your institution. So like I said, I, th I thought it might be best to introduce our case as a timeline, a series of events that began in 2009 with the adoption of the Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program. So the first cohort of faculty were recruited to this program. It's hosted through the Center for Teaching and Learning. It had been funded by the provost's office at the university. And the program goals of the Sustainability Faculty Fellows is first to create a community of faculty who are committed to integrating interdisciplinary approaches to sustainability into the UVM curriculum. And then secondly, the program goal was to enhance the understanding of sustainability concepts among faculty and students, and particularly those who are not trained in the environmental field. So we do have a school for the environment and natural resources. It's one of the eight undergraduate granting institute or units rather at our institution. But we have a college of arts and sciences, agriculture and life sciences, business school, etc. So we so this program has reached out out to individual faculty members in all units, including staff members um, at the university. And then lastly, explore teaching and course design strategies, oh, my apologies, that will engage students in sustainability from a multidisciplinary approach. So you can see that the focus is on interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approaches to embedding sustainability into curricula across the university. University. So I've listed their website at the bottom and also a reference that really explains the process of adopting and developing the sustainability leadership. Without the Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program, um, I really don't think that this requirement would have passed. We wouldn't, we simply wouldn't have had the, the, the capacity and the training of faculty to fully adopt the sustainability requirement. So a lot of, of thanks to this program in its development. So the year after the first cohort of the Sustainability Faculty Fellows, the UVM's Student Government Association, the SGA, put forth a resolution calling for a university-wide sustainability requirement. So this is also unique in that the initiative first came from the students, not, not from the administration. So it was truly a grassroots initiative. It was the students that were asking for this university-wide sustainability requirement. And to give a bit of context here, there was a prior university-wide requirement, not necessarily a general education requirement, 
but a university-wide requirement in diversity. So we've had um, race and racism in the United States and race and culture, more of a global context as a university requirement. And that came forth in the 1990s. So students at the University of Vermont wanted to see a similar university-wide sustainability requirement. Now this, this also um, was about the same time that the Faculty Senate endorsed a recommendation to form a joint committee on general education. So general education was pretty, it is pretty new at the University of Vermont. Individual units like the College of Agriculture and Life Science and the College of Arts and Sciences have a core curriculum, have distribution requirements within their college, but this, these general education themes would be university-wide. So this joint committee was made up of administrators and faculty senate, and we established six learning outcome categories. <clears throat> Let me apologize about my voice. I'm a little under the weather, so I'm gonna try to hang in for the, for the duration here. So this six learning outcomes categories that were put forth by this joint committee are listed here. <clears throat> so you can see that sustainability was sort of tagged on with sciences, systems, and sustainability. Currently, we have a gen ed requirement in quantitative reasoning. We have um, writing and information literacy. We also have the diversity requirement and the sustainability requirement. The others are yet to be adopted. <clears throat> So the year after the joint committee formed and put forth these six themes for general education, the Senate vice president, who was at that point Stephanie Kaza, called for the formation <clears throat> of a sustainability learning outcomes ad hoc committee of the faculty Senate. And this was in direct response to the SGA resolution to adopt a university wide sustainability curriculum. So for the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about the Sustainability Learning Outcomes Committee. So SLO is Sustainability Learning Outcomes. So <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I co-chaired the SLO committee along with my colleague, Dean Long. And <clears throat> essentially what I did was I showed up to a meeting that Stephanie called and raised my hand and volunteered to work on this. And at this point, I was a, a pretty junior faculty member. Um, Dean was a, a, a for, Dean Wong was a former dean of one of the units, the Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources. So the two of us together, I think, made a really good team. And in addition to that, we did follow a co-chair model. And we still follow that model today. I think that was also a key component to our success. It didn't just fall on one person. But the committee was charged with developing sustainability learning outcomes and <clears throat> to design the options by which the students could meet the requirement. We really wanted to engage the entire UVM community to think about sustainability. And eventually our goal, of course, was to gain passage of a sustainability requirement through the approval of the Faculty Senate. <clears throat> now we have a, um, we had a working wiki page, which is listed at the bottom. That gives you a little bit, if you want to visit that page, a little bit of historical context of um, how we were working. It's not a formal website, but it was a working site that we disseminated throughout the university. <clears throat> so in this way, we took the SGA resolution and we moved it up to the faculty to develop this working group, this ad hoc committee, again, to design, approve, and implement this sustainability requirement university-wide. So I'd like to mention the structure of this committee because I think it is an important component to our success. As I mentioned previously, 
we have always operated with the co-chair model. We met <clears throat> every other week for three semesters. So it was a very uh, time intensive process. Um, we included faculty and recruited faculty from all of those eight undergraduate degree granting units on campus. This was also a key component to our success. So every college had a, one or two representatives that could bring to light to, the, to their particular college or school what was happening, but also bring that voice into the room of what the individual colleges and schools need. We also included student members. <clears throat> we had both undergraduate and graduate students as a key voice in developing this requirement. And we also interacted with a multitude of stakeholders across campus. In this next slide, we'll talk more specifically about those stakeholders. <clears throat> so here in the middle is our, um, our ad hoc committee. And all the arrows point to the various people, stakeholders that we worked with. So members <clears throat> of the ad hoc committee included students and faculty, as I mentioned previously. It also included, and we worked closely with the associate provost for teaching and learning. But in addition to that, we worked alongside the SGA, the registrar's office, the faculty senate, <clears throat> the sustainability faculty fellows program, and our office of sustainability. and particularly the STARS program. So <clears throat> another key to success was really the fact that we are operating under a value system. So essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, essentially it took about five years of dedicated voluntary faculty service time to overcome barriers and develop and implement and maintain the sustainability requirement. So we are very patient and we are also resilient through a lot of um, resistance. <clears throat> we also had faculty and staff committee members volunteering to work on this initiative through a personal commitment to sustainability. So we were um, lucky to have a, a group that was passionate and engaged by developing <clears throat> personal relationships and allies among various stakeholder groups intentionally, each step of the process was really strategically considered. So we were very strategic and process aware through the entire process. The committee <clears throat> addressed faculty and student concerns and we worked within existing administrative structures so that communicative and transparent value was also very important to the passage of this institutional wide requirement. Um, we also developed events and structures that I'll talk more about to engage the community. And we also responded to comments publicly. So we were collaborative and open to critique the entire time. Um, the flexible value comes in two ways. So first, we were flexible along the way in responding to feedback but we also created a flexible learning outcomes based model that allowed students to meet the requirement in multiple ways as ira mentioned via a course a curriculum or an experiential endeavor and then lastly of course we we wanted to um, have the value of sustainability sustainability as a curricular requirement must be sustainable to perpetuate over time the requirement must meet the needs of faculty and staff involved in the process to balance our workloads. And the requirement must be flexible so that students meet the requirement within existing curricular frameworks. So in our paper, Dean and I do pull out this values framework as an, as an essential component to our success. In addition to that, in, in order to allow this case study to be translated to other institutions. We have a typical governance structure 
at the University of Vermont, where we have um, a board of trustees, president and provost. We also, I'm gonna focus here on the governance and advisory bodies that we worked with. So the institutional dynamics that were associated with implementing the gen ed requirement and sustainability. So down at the bottom here, we coordinated stakeholder involvement along the way. This included reps from the SGA, the Graduate Student Senate, Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program, Office of Sustainability, the Associate Provost of Teaching and Learning and the Faculty Senate President. So those were key stakeholders in the approval process. Now that it's been approved and we're in the third year, um, implementation and ongoing success, we also needed to facilitate shared governance. So really push the limits at the University of Vermont, we lack an office of general education. Um, we lack a director. Um, so essentially it really was a, a grassroots initiative. It really pushed the limits of shared governance. Um, and then of course, ongoing success is directly linked to sustain, sustaining faculty oversight. So the faculty are in charge of the curriculum, but of course the shared governance structure includes the administrators. So moving on and getting back to the timeline, as the Sustainability Learning Outcomes Ad Hoc Committee was working, really our goal was to get the entire campus talking about sustainability, and this was for better or for worse. There was a lot of resistance, but we did achieve this goal and everybody was talking about sustainability. So what we did is um, we did a lot of presentations. We solicited a lot of feedback. This was really open and transparent, that value that was key to success. So first we solicited open feedback on our draft sustainability learning outcomes, which I'll present next. That wiki site, which was a working site, was disseminated to the entire university for feedback. We, hold very, we held various forums for students and faculty. The best attended forums was actually those um, that targeted the students. Uh, we had a blog that solicited specifically faculty feedback on the learning outcomes because the faculty forum were um, pretty sparsely attended. We presented multiple times each semester to the faculty senate this transparency, just if nothing else to inform them of what we were working on, what we were doing to gain any feedback and to address any concerns. We also presented to the Student Government Association multiple times. So in presentations to the Faculty Senate, Dean and I, Dean Wong and I, um, really hesitated to define sustainability because we really wanted it to be a disciplinary specific um, we wanted to have it really be flexible, but we were pushed to adopt a university definition of sustainability, which we ultimately did. So what we did is we took the sort of traditional Brundtland Commission, society, economy, and, and environment to develop this definition of sustainability at the University of Vermont. So at UVM, sustainability is the pursuit of ecological, social, and economic vitality with the understanding that the needs of the present must be met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So as I mentioned, we developed and then vetted draft sustainability learning outcomes through the university committee and we got feedback. And these are our final outcomes. <clears throat> so the first is that um, just the knowledge outcome, students can have an informed conversation about the multiple dimensions and complexity of sustainability. The skills outcome is really based on the disciplinary specific approach. 
So regardless of discipline, students can evaluate sustainability using an evidence-based disciplinary approach and integrate the multiple dimensions of sustainability, economic, ecological, and social. The third outcome falls under the values category, um, thinking critically about sustainability and also having a scale of local to global, so across a diversity of cultural values and across multiple scales of uh, relevance from local to global. We also had a fourth outcome that fell under the personal domain. <clears throat> So students as members of society recognize and assess how sustainability impacts their lives and how their actions impact sustainability. So I'll talk more about this in a minute, but when the Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee reviews courses and curricula and experiential endeavors, we're looking for evidence that the curriculum, the course, or the experience hits on all of these four sustainability learning outcomes. The sustainability learning outcomes ad hoc committee also developed a framework whereby students could meet the requirement via a course, being enrolled in a particular curriculum, or some uh, experience that they have, experiential education could be curricular, like a um, internship or research project or co-curricular. And I'll get back to this in a bit. So we had um, sort of a phase one and phase two where we asked the faculty senate to vote um, on approving this. We were gonna push right ahead and ask them, ask the senate to vote on approving a university-wide requirement in um, fall 2014. But again, we had a lot of resistance and we were not uh, confident that it would pass. So we backpedaled a little bit and instead we asked in the spring of 2014 for the Faculty Senate to vote to approve the sustainability learning outcomes as revised and to approve to form a, a formal Senate committee. So remember, we had been working on an ad hoc basis up to now. So it was approved in 2014. This is a familiar slide. I just want to point here that they did approve to adopt a formal sustainability curriculum review committee. We maintained a very similar structure, student members, faculty from all eight undergraduate degree granting units and the associate provost for teaching and learning as an ex officio member. We were also lucky that many members of that ad hoc committee stayed on to um, adopt and inaugurate this sustainability curriculum review committee. So let me go back here. So the SCRC, the curriculum review committee was tasked with um, in the next year to move toward a formal adoption of this university-wide sustainability requirement. We had a lot of work to do. The faculty had two major concerns. The first was about capacity. The second was about assessment. So I'll take each of these in turn. Capacity. So how we address this concern about capacity was, we worked closely with the Office of Sustainability, who was working uh, under the STARS, HG STARS program. And what we did is we took those sustainability focused courses at the University of Vermont, and we asked the Senate to provisionally approve them for one year as a sustainability or SU course. So we had a feedstock of courses for the first year, 2015, 2016. After that first year, the faculty of those courses, sustainability focused courses, had to submit a course proposal to achieve full approval. But again, we had a nice feeder of courses that students could take in that first year to achieve the requirement. So that got at the capacity question. I'll also get back to the capacity question in just a minute. 
the second was the second faculty concern from the Senate was assessment. How will we know whether the students are meeting these four learning outcomes? So <clears throat> the ad hoc committee wrote the sustainability outcomes in order to be assessed. So we wrote them in such a way that you could ask that question, are the students meeting them, gather indirect and direct data, and then assess whether or not students were meeting these four requirements. We had those outcomes verified by an education specialist at the, UV, at the University of Vermont and write a report that we then submitted to the Senate. The Sustainability Learning Outcomes Ad Hoc Committee had also developed an assessment matrix again, underscoring ways in which we could assess these learning outcomes. We also have a general education assessment group in sustainability currently in progress. Um, they're in the second year now. They're gathering data from a volunteer cohort of faculty. So data are coming in, so stay tuned. We plan to write a paper about that in the next year or two. So getting back to capacity, um, there's a lot of numbers on the screen. Don't worry too much about the numbers, but what I'd like to underscore here are two main things. The first is that this is a four-year requirement. So in any year of the requirement, students can meet the, um, the requirement either, again, by taking a course, being enrolled in a curriculum, or having an experience. We anticipated that most students would want to, this is a course-based model, so we would assume that most students would meet the requirement in their first or second year. So we assume that 70% of students would meet the requirement by their junior year. We included historic retention um, based on historical data. We included transfer students, about 450 transfer students a year, and that allowed us to calculate the total number of seats needed. Okay, over here. So this model estimates annual enrollment of about 2,400 first year students plus the transfer students. Now a key theme here, and also a component to our success, was that uh, my, my co-chair Dean Wong and I developed this model in collaboration with the Registrar and the Office of Institutional Research. Um, <clears throat> Dean was a member of the Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources before he retired last year. So I am a member of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I was the one usually at the microphone presenting to the Faculty Senate. Um, behind the scenes here, again, being process and strategic, process aware and strategic, Dean and I really didn't want this requirement to be seen as a requirement that only includes environmental courses. So we were strategic in me as a junior faculty member and also as a non-environmental educator um, to be the presenter. At this point, I also was presenting with the registrar. At that point, Keith Williams was a registrar. He came and he presented this model along, along with us. And I think that was a key component to um, convincing the faculty that we, in fact, did have capacity for this requirement. And again, going back, without the Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program, feeding courses every year into the curriculum, we wouldn't have met this capacity. Okay, so the Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee also developed a course proposal submission process. So again, going back to those four sustainability learning outcomes, when we get a proposal, which you can view here um, under our faculty resources website, if you're interested in more, more information, the curriculum review committee is really looking for how faculty um, address each of these learning outcomes. All four have to be addressed. Three of the four learning outcomes have to be reinforced. And what we're looking for there is assessment. And assessment can be anything from a class discussion 
to a, uh, a final paper and anything in between. So rather than having a reading or a lecture, which would be introduced, three of the four also have to be reinforced. The students have to take that introductory material in and process it in some way in a class discussion, a reflective paper, an exam question or series of questions, et cetera. We also have a five-year periodic review cycle in place. So we haven't gone through this periodic review because we're just in the third year now, but we're anticipating it coming up. So this periodic review cycle is really meant to maintain rigor of the courses in sustainability. Um, this was current, this was uh, lacking in other courses, or I'm sorry, in other requirements like the diversity requirement. So it was a key component to maintaining rigor of the sustainability requirement over time. Okay, so remember that phase one was to approve the learning outcomes and form the SCRC. Phase two was to um, ask the Senate to approve a university-wide gen ed requirement and sustainability beginning in fall 2015. So after many, many presentations to the Faculty Senate over that year. It was approved in the spring of 2015. As you can see with the data, it was not unanimous. Um, again, we are Vermont, we are UVM. We do have a lot of institutional structures that support sustainability from operations to courses. But we did, again, still have a lot of faculty, particularly from professional programs and from disciplines where they just simply weren't convinced that sustainability had anything to do with their particular discipline. But it was approved and we did move forward with implementation of the sustainability requirement. So this is a, um, a table that presents the distribution of sustainability courses among all of our eight undergraduate degree granting units. So, you know, don't worry too much about the units here, but um, you can see, I'll get back to this. This is the business school. They have one course. Um, and another is up for review. We'll review it tomorrow in our meeting. But I'll present some data that will show that with that one core course in their curriculum, the vast majority of students have already met the requirement. This is the College of Nursing and Health Science. It's a professional program. Again, they have one core course to not, not overburden their students. And we're gathering data on how many students who are now juniors have already met that requirement. The institution, I'm sorry, the um, unit at the institution that is the largest is the College of Arts and Sciences. The College of Arts and Sciences also has the largest number of courses and percent of courses offered at the University of Vermont. So let me capture some of the diversity of courses offered through the College of Arts and Sciences to demonstrate the university-wide across the curriculum sustainability requirement. This is just a sample of courses, again, from Arts and Sciences on how sustainability is taught from a disciplinary specific framework, everything from anthropology to art to biology chemistry, classics, economics, English, geography, geology, uh, languages like German, philosophy, political science, religion, sociology, Spanish, and Western literature. So again, a lot of these faculty teaching these courses were members of the Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program. So they were able to use the disciplinary specific framework to fully adopt what sustainability means to a chemist, what sustainability means to um, a romance language professional like Spanish. So we're thankful for the Sustainability Faculties Fellows Program and work in collaboration with them to uh, keep these faculty trained in courses coming in to the flow of the curriculum. So getting back to our timeline of events, Fall 2015 was when the university-wide requirement was adopted. And then we have the work ahead of us in that year, 2015-16, the work of the Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee 
to implement this requirement. So implementation involved a few key things. First, it involved um, the SCRC, again, is the Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee. We had to solicit and review proposals for sustainability or SU approval. We had to work with the various stakeholders in the figure I presented previously, including the Sustainability Faculty Fellows, the SFF, to continue to build capacity in curricular course, curricular, and experiential pathways. We had to continue to work with the administration and garner support for general education as a whole. We're still working on this. So again, this sustainability gen ed requirement was passed without really having support for general education as a whole at the university. It was a grassroots initiative and it passed without an institutional structure for general education. Now, it's a little messy, um, but again, just a word of advice is don't wait. If the support is there from the students and faculty and you can garner support from an administration, move forward. We also had the Sustainability General Education Assessment Committee form members of the Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee and others were members of the assessment committee. So we work closely with the assessment group. And again, we had to continue, or we do and had to continually present to the faculty senate. How are we doing? Are we meeting capacity? Um, are there any concerns or questions? We were pleased to be able, again, working with the registrar's office to, to say that we exceeded capacity for the first year based on that model that I presented a few slides ago. So we, we did quite well in that first year. And again, the one year provisional courses through the HG Star sustainability focused courses had to um, go through the course review process to be approved under the five year periodic review cycle. But we were doing pretty good in the first year of implementation. So getting back to the multiple ways that students can meet this requirement, most courses, I'm sorry, most students meet this requirement by taking a course. But we wanted to have flexibility and we wanted it to be sustainable for students, particularly students who are in uh, professional programs or programs that are just really difficult for students to fit in an extra course. How else can they meet the requirement? Currently, three curricula meet UVM's sustainability learning outcomes. Um, we have two engineering programs, curriculum, civil and environmental engineering. We also have um, the an environmental studies program. In the pipeline, and we're working with different cur curriculum, uh, uh, curricula across campus, we're hoping that the business school will submit a curriculum um, proposal. So the curriculum proposal includes the core courses that all students take when enrolled in that curriculum. Now, that means that through a series of courses, not just one course, the students meet the four sustainability learning outcomes. So in the introductory course, perhaps one or two of the learning outcomes are met. And then in other courses, a capstone course, for example, the remaining outcomes are met. So essentially it can be spread through multiple courses throughout the curriculum, as long as it's a core curriculum that students all, all take those courses. Um, <clears throat> experiential education is one that we are focusing our attention on currently. We have two pathways by which students can meet this. There's a faculty pathway, faculty who host internships or have a research program can submit a proposal for that particular internship or research program to be approved. We also have a student pathway, students in a living and learning community um, in a research program or in an internship can also submit a proposal 
to have that be counted as meeting the um, sustainability learning outcomes requirement. In our meeting tomorrow, we're meeting with a person who leads one of the learning communities to see whether or not the learning community and the different um, aspects of that learning community could be passed as, a, um, as an SU learning community, a sustainability learning community. So because this is a, a bit outside of the box, we haven't really figured out, or we haven't really, we figured it out, but we're trying to build capacity for this by talking with staff and faculty and students. So this is um, under works right now, but again, one of the initiatives for this year to build capacity for experiential education. So after implementation, we come into the maintenance component of the sustainability requirement. So in order to maintain this requirement, we have to develop policies, like policies for transfer students. We have to continue to solicit and review proposals. There was an ad, there is an ad hoc committee of general education, a coordinating committee that has formed and is working on some of the procedures at the level of general education at the university. So including sustainability, diversity, um, writing and information literacy, and quantitative reasoning. So those four gen ed requirements. We also have assessment groups that under each of those four categories that are continuing university-wide. We're moving toward an accreditation in 2019. So we're really working hard to gather data on whether or not these learning outcomes are being met and how. Again, we're continuing to build capacity for not just the course pathway, but the curricular and experiential pathway. And lastly, we can see then we continue to disseminate information by presenting to the governing bodies. <coughs> including the Faculty Senate and the Student Government Association. Okay, so the question, are we meeting capacity today? Um, again, students who entered matriculated in 2015, they're now juniors. We're in the process of gathering data. We're again, collaborating with the registrar's office. They often attend um, our, our meetings and we're in close contact with them to work with them and work within these existing structures. Um, and we're gathering data to present to the Faculty Senate this semester. But we do have, I just wanna to present to you a bit of data from one of our units, the Grossman School of Business. So the School of Business, remember, they had 1% of the courses, one course. With that one course, the vast majority of students have already completed their requirement, sustainability requirement by their junior year. Only 17 have not completed it. And um, just to get a sense of how many transfer students are involved, seven transfer students have met their sustainability requirement by transferring what we refer to as a sustainability equivalent course. Um, if anybody has any questions about the transfer policy or the nuances of the transfer, please just um, put a comment in for Ira and I can talk more about that. Okay, so I think everybody is, so that, you know, that's our story, that's our case. Um, now I'd like to give some recommendations from our experience. And these recommendations are part of the paper that's currently in press. It should be available pretty soon here in the International Journal of Sustainability and Higher Ed. The first, and I really have to um, attribute a lot of this knowledge to my co-chair, Dean Wong. He really understood, again, being a former dean, being a, a member of the institution for many, many years, the institutional processes. So really be sensitive to institutional processes. Don't try to uh, stray too far from these, try to work within existing institutional processes as much as possible. But on the, on the other side, you know, don't let that restrict any forward movement. 
I really, uh, my colleagues and I really think that developing a values framework and following that values framework was a key component to success. So again, those values being patient, resilient, passionate and engaged, strategic and process aware, communicative and transparent, uh, collaborative, open to critique, flexible, and then sustainable across the board for staff, faculty, and students. Again, we, um, we are lucky at the University of Vermont to have a very active student body who's very interested in sustainability at both the operational level and at the educational level. So involve students, um, gain their support, and really utilize their voice. Um, <clears throat> when push came to shove, for the requirement to be passed when it came up to a vote, we had a room full of students in the faculty senate meeting. And I think just having that student support and their presence there was a key component. Remember, they're the ones that asked for this. If your institution doesn't already have a faculty learning community in sustainability, develop one and allow for time for faculty to be trained to effectively um, teach sustainability across the curriculum, regardless of discipline. And um, again, there's a paper written by uh, Stephanie Kaza, Tara Rouse, and Lisa Watts-Natkin on our Sustainability Faculty Fellows Program at the University of Vermont. It's one of those first slides if you'd like to read about our development. This is a key component, and it follows the pedagogical framework of backwards design. Many people that I've talked to at various institutions are just stuck about capacity, you know, we, but we, we tackled that second. First, we developed learning outcomes. What do we want our students to know? And again, along with the faculty fellows program, then we were able to tackle the capacity question. But before you get into the details and the numbers, think broadly about what sustain sustainability means to you at your institution and what you want your students to know. In addition to that, make sure that the um, learning outcomes align with the mission of the institution. So the university mission has a lot of language similar to learning outcomes um, for the sustainability requirement. So we have that alignment. Again, getting back to our values, being open and being transparent, doing lots of dissemination of information, hosting um, different forums to gain feedback and, uh, and, um, and support from faculty and students and administrators, presenting to the Faculty Senate and other governing bodies is, was very important to this pro process. Even if we just had five minutes for an update in a faculty senate meeting, we were up there presenting more or less every month in that year prior to full adoption of the requirement. So again, our goal was to get everybody talking about sustainability for better or worse, and we achieved that goal through this um, dissemination of information. We really worked hard to develop authentic relationships with the administration, with faculty, and with students to garner support for this requirement and continue to. The sustainability committees, both the ad hoc committee and the formal Senate committee, the sustainability curriculum review committee, um, both had an inclusive structure. So again, we had faculty from all undergraduate degree granting units on campus. Our committee has always involved students. We also have administrators who are non-voting ex officio, but are still present at pretty much every meeting. We invite in administrators like the registrar's office um, staff to come in so we can work with them to continue the maintenance of this requirement. Again, it is important to, to determine feasibility with capacity analysis. So if it's a course-based model or whatever model you're proposing at your institution, work with your institutional research office, work with your registrar's office, 
and really determine whether or not it's feasible. And if it's not, maybe give it another year before you ask the faculty or governing body to, to vote to approve it. So that's what we did. We're, we were we slowed down a bit because we needed to get, garner more support and address capacity and assessment concerns. And again, keep an eye on assessment. Make sure that your learning outcomes um, are truly written to be accessible, able to be assessed. How will we know if students are meeting learning outcomes? Um, get a group of people involved in assessment, particularly of the sustainability requirement. So thank you all for listening. I know we had people from various institutions across North America, the United States and Canada. Here's my contact information. Again, our paper is in press and should be available pretty soon here um, online. So send me an email if you'd like me to send you that paper directly and I'll open it up to any questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. This is Ira again. Thanks for that great presentation, uh, very detailed on the process and great uh, specific recommendations. I've been monitoring the um, incoming messages in the chat box and um, uh, we have quite a few that I've uh, managed to sort through and group. Um, I'll start with the ones that seem to be amenable to quicker answers. And uh, there are a couple that may require more elaboration. And you'll let me know if your voice uh, can continue. So um, let me start with um, one question about simply the structure of the colleges at University of Vermont, uh, a question came in, how would you describe the relations among colleges at the university, more a culture of cooperation or a culture of competition? Does the university's budget model facilitate or exacerbate good relations? That's a great question. Um, something I didn't mention, so I appreciate the question, something I didn't mention in the presentation was that at the very same time that we were working to um, pass the sustainability requirement, the budget model had changed at the University of Vermont. The budget had previously been in full control of the provost office and it has now changed. And I think this was um, really right parallel to the adoption of the sustainability requirement, changed to what we refer to as an incentive based budget and IBB model, where then the, the colleges, the deans have control of the money and the money flows through student credit hours. What we've seen as a result of that, well, we've seen many things, but what we've seen is um, sort of a shift from being uh, fairly collaborative among colleges to being more competitive for student credit hours. Now we're working in it, uh, we're in phase two right now of the incentive-based budget model, the IBB model. The service office just solicited a bunch of feedback about how we can make it better. Um, but yeah, so we went into it and I think, again, it was the faculty fellows program helping to underscore to faculty how these, how sustainability can be taught in an interdisciplinary way that helped foster collaboration but we are seeing now a more competitive um, environment among colleges and schools. Thanks. Uh, another um, basic, lec I'll call it a lexicon uh, question is, many of the attendees on the line are familiar with or actually actively engaged in their own dialogues in um, core competencies mm -hmm. and your um, phrase was uh, learning outcomes. How would you distinguish between uh, learning outcomes and core competencies or would you distinguish between them uh, or, or view them as uh, equivalent? Right, another good question, thank you. So 
our, so I am a member um, of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, which is in the plant biology, or the plant biology department is, is part of that college. We have core competencies for our college and they are not necessarily written under the learning outcomes framework. So I think it depends. Our core comp competencies are quantitative reasoning, right? So if students take a math course, a course in statistics, they meet that competency. The learning outcomes are written to be assessed upon completion of the course curriculum or experience students will be able to dot 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 so i do distinguish between competencies and outcomes but again it depends on how the competencies are written competencies can certainly be written to be um, outcomes okay and uh another i think short an answer question is um are graduate students within the scope of this effort or is that contemplated? Um, right now it is an undergraduate requirement. We don't have any general education requirements for graduate students. So this is simply an undergraduate requirement at UDM. Okay. And um, during uh, the timeline in question, um, we saw the emergence of the sustainable development goals. Uh, did the SDGs have any impact on how your process uh, was framed or how it rolled out? I think, um, yes, behind the scenes, many of the people who are developing these were are, are or were sustainability educators. So I think um, it didn't, the development goals didn't take a front and center role, but they were certainly informing the way in which we are writing the sustainability learning outcomes. Another set of questions and comments revolve around uh, the slide that noted uh, the one course in the business school and to try to synthesize uh, those questions and comments um, is the state of play at the business school attributable largely to uh, capacity or resistance or something else? The fact that there's only a single course in the business school? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, no, I don't believe there's any resistance. Actually, the, the Grossman School of Business at the university is known for its sustainable, sustainable business program. It is currently a master's program. But I think essentially what, what we see there with that one course is that um, they wanted all students to meet this requirement. They chose a core course to embed the sustainability learning outcomes and got that passed immediately. And what they're working on right now, and my colleague Marilyn Lucas, who's been with us since the beginning, she helped develop the learning outcomes. She's a member in the School of Business on the Sustainability Curriculum Review Committee and she was able to provide those data that I presented to you. Um, I believe that they're working on getting their curriculum approved. We haven't seen the proposal yet, but I don't think there's any resistance. I just think there's, with everything else, overburdened faculty, um, a little bit of inertia in submitting a curriculum proposal, which is um, a lot more complex than just a single course. But those faculty did want to make sure that their students could meet the requirement, which the data show that they are, with a course. So if I understand you, that one course is, is one course that's available to undergrads, but there are other courses at the graduate level in their master's program. That's true. Yep. Okay. That, that, that I think is a good clarification. Um, at a couple of different points along the way in your presentation, you mentioned um, resistance. Uh, in your opening slides and then more specifically uh, with the um, uh, the SLO uh, committee. And you did then proceed to um, break that down into two primary areas, capacity and assessment. Um, just out of curiosity, were there, were there other 
baskets uh, that could be labeled uh, areas of resistance or did those two um, primarily cover the, uh, the, the root causes of resistance? Um, those were the two big ones that we had to address in order to get the requirement passed through the Senate. But yes, resistance <clears throat> came in many forms. Um, one major piece of resistance that we saw from faculty was mainly from faculty who were in, who teach in professional programs like the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, where their students are full to the brim on required courses. And there's this sense in general education, you know, in, in general, our students simply cannot take one more course. There's no room. So we got a lot of resistance from professional programs. So we worked closely with those faculty to figure out how those students could be, uh, could meet the requirement without having to take an additional course. In other words, how can we use existing courses to embed sustainability themes and meet the learning outcomes requirement? Um, the second piece of resistance I think was from faculty who just simply had um, just an overall resistance to the idea of sustainability. They didn't think it was important to their particular discipline. They didn't know how it would inform their teaching and they just simply didn't want one extra thing to have to think about. So um, that was a lot of the feedback that we got from faculty individually. And I think that's why we got, you know, the end vote was about 30% or so of faculty voting against it. Those were the faculty who maybe they weren't convinced that we met capacity, we could meet capacity, or could assess the learning outcomes, but I think it was more a, I don't, I'm not on board with sustainability. I don't know how it applies to me or to my students. A final set of uh, questions and comments, Laura, uh, probed a little bit more deeply into the uh, question of assessment and um, several attendees noted that if you've got three pathways toward completing the requirement, then um, the assumption is you've got um, three different sets of data or metrics that need to be tracked. Uh, I don't know if that is a correct assessment uh, or assumption. Uh, maybe you can elaborate on that. And in particular, um, although I did hear you say that the uh, experiential or extracurricular third option is a work in progress. Uh, maybe you can specifically talk about how that is or would be assessed. Right. Um, so in working with assessment, sort of separate from the work I do at the University in Sustainability, um, there's various data points that we can gather around assessment that doesn't necessarily matter if it's a course curriculum or experiential activity, as long as the data are uh, directly assessing student work. So the student work could be, let's, let's take a research um, example. So a student who is, who is doing research, that research meets the four sustainability learning outcomes. We do need faculty oversight and we need faculty to assess that they're meeting those four requirements. So even if it's a research project that needs to culminate in some research presentation, paper, et cetera, that then the assessment committee could look at to then see whether or not the four learning outcomes are in fact being met. So similar to a curricular based model, there's not just one course, there's multiple courses. So can we get direct student work from those um, courses that are part of the core curriculum and then assess that. So again, the assessment comes down to the student's work and it doesn't matter if it's extra uh, curricular work or experiential work, um, work within an existing curriculum or work within a course. I think assessment is, is at the same level regardless of the pathway. With that, Laura, I, on behalf of the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium and all the attendees today want to thank you for an excellent presentation. We all learned a lot. Um, I've mentioned in the chat box that the um, recording 
will be posted uh, certainly this week on the SEC uh, website. And uh, from me and others who are in the chat box saying goodbye, we're also saying we hope you feel better. And oh, thank you. Thank, thank you for uh, uh, doing your presentation under less than ideal circumstances today. Many thanks. Thank you, Ira. Best of luck to everybody.